بالله من الشيطان العين الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم والصلاة والسلام على أشرف الأنبياء والمرسلين سيدنا ونبينا أبي القاسم المصطفى الأمين وعلى أهل بيت الطيبين الطاهرين المعصومين المبلومين ولعنة الله على أعدائهم أجمعين من الآن إلى قيام يوم الدين آمين يا رب العالمين Ladies and gentlemen Brothers and sisters in Islam, dear respected viewers of the Imam Hussein Television Network, I would like to welcome you once more to this episode in this very short series of reflections pertinent to topics inspired by the time of the year that we happen to be in, namely the martyrdom of the beloved daughter of the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi Fatima al-Zahra alayhi salam. Of course, it is always a sensitive period of the year and the topics which one finds many of us discuss at this time of the year always center around this blessed lady, this lady who was the wife of Amir al-Mu'mineen, the daughter of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi and is, of course, renowned for numerous favail, numerous merits, which, mashallah alaykum, those of you from the Shi'i audience are no stranger to. Indeed, Fatima al-Zahra alayhi salam is one of the 14 infallibles of this ummah, recognized by the Shia. And what that means is we have definitely given her for respect and honor that one would expect us to give to someone who belongs to such an immaculate and perfect collection of human beings. She is, of course, a hujjah of Allah upon the earth. And in discussing these topics, we need to remember that we would want to behave in a way which we hope that Fatima al-Zahra alayhi salam would want for us to behave. We need to behave in a way which is befitting of Fatima al-Zahra alayhi salam. And I think one of the major aspects which we find befitting of Fatima is a level of maturity. We hope for the guidance of humanity and for ourselves in these blessed nights and we seek closeness to Allah Azza wa Jal in commemorating the life of someone so truly magnificent as Fatima. Someone whose life is shrouded in mystery. Someone who has been described in the reports as the hijab of Allah. Now of course when we say such things we are to be taken in light of the Muhkam reports, the Muhkam ayat. When we say that someone is the word of Allah, we don't actually mean that Allah Azawajal speaks and Isa is his word in the sense that the Christian missionary would like to assume. In the same way, when we say that the Kaaba is the bait of Allah. We don't believe Allah Azza wa Jal resides within the Kaaba. This is what we call in the Arabic language an nisbatul tashrifiyah. The attribution of tashrif to make something elevated, to make something great. So when it comes to Fatima al Zahra tonight, I wish to discuss possibly a following up conversation from the previous two episodes. And that is to say, namely, what is the approach of the Shia ulama in regards to this event? What do I mean by that? 
we discussed in the previous night that dilemma, which is all too common, in which friends of ours, quite often from the most sincere brothers, quite often from the most pious brothers, and quite often from the most dedicated brothers in terms of khidmat to this religion, we find that such brothers often, when in private gatherings, they might ask ourselves, is this report of a martyrdom of Fatima to Zahra alayhi salam reliable? I know that there are some of you out there. There are some who are watching this right now. And they may very well be thinking, well, there's a plural of reasons for why they think it's unreliable, there's contradictions in the narrative and what have you. Well, to be quite frank with you, I, I, I personally believe that many of the brothers who ask this question have rarely read an account of a martyrdom of Fatima. In the same way that many of the viewers who are watching this have rarely read the account of a martyrdom of Fatima. Rather, they would have heard it from the mimbar, they would have heard it from the pulpits, they would have heard it from our speakers. Can our speakers sometimes contradict themselves? Can they contradict themselves in a way where they fail to actually point out the resolved area of conflict where there's an apparent contradiction where a contradiction doesn't even exist? Of course, we're all human after all. But what is it that actually makes these brothers doubt the account? Often it's not because they've heard contradictions on the minbar. Often it's because they might follow a particular tayyar, a particular khat, a particular line of ulama who, for reasons of perhaps political expediency or numerous other reasons, may downplay the nature and scope of this event. And yet we say to such individuals, my brother, my sister, don't worry. Come and ask the questions that you have, for surely these questions can be resolved. And part of the nature of the job of ulama, the job of muballighin, is to clarify and to give clarity to these areas where darkness happens to have fallen upon. You see, many of us, we have an emotional attachment to the Ahlul Bayt. Is that wrong? Absolutely not. Religion is nothing other than love and hate. And yet, we need to make sure that we are befitting the bill, the description, the attributes that the Ahlul Bayt, may the peace and blessings of Allah be upon them, would have wanted from their Shia. Namely, we need to have a dedication and dedicate ourselves to their sciences. We need to dedicate ourselves to understanding the world view of Ali Muhammad. And of course, in order to claim that we love Ali Muhammad, we need to understand more about their lives and of course the circumstances of their deaths. There are some who may hear this, particularly some well-minded brothers, well-minded sisters, who either belong to the Ahl Sunnah wal Jama'ah, or maybe have been influenced by the Ahl Sunnah wal Jama'ah. Even those who are influenced by the predominant worldview of the West, liberalism, who are thinking to themselves, well, why do I even need to know about the lives of the Ahlul Bayt? It's not part of religion. They came to bring us religion and religion's not about them. Well, my brother and my sister, I'd say to you that in the same way that those who love the Holy Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam from all sects of the Muslims study the life and seerah of the Holy Prophet and they come to learn about the smallest of wounds that were dealt to him during the skirmishes. They come to learn about his habits they come to learn about the tiniest of details from his life in order to detract and subtract from such things inspiration. We ourselves would likewise like to do the same thing when it comes to Fatima Zahra alayhi salam. 
We would like to do this when it comes to all of the 14 infallibles. And indeed, we even derive lessons from the companions of all of the infallibles, be from the prophets, companions, or the companions of the imams. May Allah be pleased with the righteous companions. Of course, I would like to launch into tonight's topic, namely, is this position amongst the Shia a Shah position? Is it an isolated position to believe that Fatima was attacked? To put it quite frankly, with all the rhetoric that's floating around the Muslim world today, with all the rhetoric that we find on the internet, let's ask the question in a formula or phrased in a particular way which is more befitting to that which is actually within the hearts and minds of many of the believers watching this show tonight. Is the event of the attack on the door, is the martyrdom of Fatima alayhi salam a Safavid concoction? Is this something that later generations came forward to concoct, to fabricate? Or is this something which is part and parcel of the beliefs of mainstream Tashayo al Ifna Ashari al Imami? This is the question I wish to deal with tonight. Before I move on to the first quote, I would like to introduce the personality and the biography of His Eminence, Sheikh Muhammad. Ibn Hassan At-Tusi, known as the Sheikh of the Ta'ifa, the Sheikh of the sect. No dwarf when it comes to the realm of the transmitted sciences. Indeed, in the field of Ilm al-Rajal, two of the major sources are directly written by Sheikh At-Tusi namely the Fahrist and the Book of Rajal. And the third of those major primary sources of Ilma Rajal is compiled by Sheikh Atusi himself, namely the Ikhtiar, the Ma'rafat al-Rajal of Sheikh al-Qishi. Sheikh al-Qishi, I believe I just pronounced it with a Qaf at first as opposed to a Kaf. Sheikh al-Qishi, his biography of the Rajal, not biography, but his collection of biographical reports of the Rajal is one of the most important books we have today. And yet this book was saved and compiled by Sheikh Atusi. So Sheikh Atusi is not someone alien to the Akbar. Indeed, two of the books of the four major books of reports is also gathered by Sheikh Atusi, namely Al Istibsar and Tahabib Al Ahkam. Sheikh Atusi states in his famous work, which is called Talkhis Ashafi. Talkhis Ashafi. Talkhis Ashafi is a summarized, condensed version of an earlier book written by one of the great scholars of the Imamiyya, namely Sharif al Murtada. Who is Sharif al Murtada? Sharif al Murtada is the brother of Sharif al-Ravi, the compiler of Naj al a famous book which is upon the shelves of many of the Imamiyya, translated into a plethora of different languages. Unfortunately, an English translation remains, the, the available English translations remain lacking, sadly. But this work, which is so well known, compiled by Sharif al-Ravi, unfortunately, there's many mu'mineen out there who believe it's actually written and compiled by Imam Ali. This is a mistake. This is the sermons attributed to Imam Ali, known for their eloquence and compiled by one of our great scholars, Sharif al-Ravi, the brother of Sharif al-Murtada. Sharif al-Murtada's book, Shafi fil Imama, is considered a magnus opus work in the field of Ilm al-Kalam, refuting the arguments and shubahat of the Mu'tazala, and particularly one of the Mu'tazalis, known as Qavi, Abdul Jabbar, who wrote his book Al Mughni and has two volumes on the area of Imama. Sharif al Murtada wrote a refutation of that book, and this refutation is called Al Shafi 
fil Imam. Of course, it's a very excellent book, and the introduction of the newly annotated edition is written by none other than His Eminence, Sayyid Fadl al Milani, one of ulama here in London. Sheikh Atusi. Why have I selected Sheikh Atusi? Because being no stranger to the Akbar, Sheikh Atusi is someone who inherited from the intellectual line of his two teachers, Sheikh Al Mufid and Sharif Al Murtada. Yet Sheikh Al Mufid and Sharif Al Murtada were known for showing a diligence when it came to the reports of Al Muhammad. Due to the amounts of fabrications which had reached the time of Sharif or Al Murtada, and particularly his teacher Sheikh Al Mufid, they argued for taking only those reports which were mutawatir. When we say mutawatir, we don't mean mutawatir by the istilahi term found in Ulum al Hadith. Rather, we mean in terms of not being khabr al ahad, not being isolated in its reports. We find that Sheikh al says the following in his Talkhis al Shafi. One of their offenses which were held in contempt was their beating Fatima alayhi salam. It is narrated that she was whipped and it is well known and without any contention among the Shias is that Amr hit her on the stomach so she miscarried Hassan. Such a narrative is quite famous among them. Add to this their attempt to burn her house when some people sought shelter in it, refusing to swear the oath of allegiance to him. Nobody denies this narrative at all because we have proven how such a narrative is transmitted by way of the Awam, by the Sunnis, via al balavari and others. And the narratives transmitted by the Shias are numerous, that is to say it's Mustafiv, and there are no contradictions in them. Nobody has the right to say that if this were true, it would not be a serious charge because an Imam has the right to threaten those who refuse to swear fealty to him, unlike other Muslims. This is not true because there is no excuse whatsoever for anyone to burn the house of Fatima and of the commander of the faithful and of Hassan and of Al Hussein How can a heinous action such as this actually be justified. I'm quoting the words of Sheikh Atusi. Rather, one will be acting contrary to the consensus of the Muslims. Had such consensus been fixed and proven, it is accurate and fixed when the commander of the faithful السلام, and those who refuse to swear the oath of allegiance from amongst those who sought shelter at Fatima's house entering into it and not getting out of it. What consensus is this while the commander of a faithful refused to endorse it? Let alone others who refuse to swear the oath of allegiance to him. Anyone such as Ajubai and others who says cl clearly demonstrates his animosity and fanaticism because the incident of the burning took place prior to the forced swearing of allegiance by the commander of a faithful and the group of men who were in, in his house who were likewise forced to swear it. They claimed such consensus after such swearing, that is, when those refused to swear did indeed swear it though against their wish. What we have rejected is surely contemptible. This is found in Talqis Shafi, the summary of a Shafi fil Imama of Sheikh Atusi. Likewise, we find that Sharif al murtala Sharif al murtala the compiler of the original al Shafi, the non summarized version, has likewise approved of the same events. But just to continue, I'd like to quote what Tusi says further. Balavari quoting al Mada'ini from Maslama bin Maharrab, from Sulaym al Tamami, from Aba'aun, says Abu Bakr sent Amr to Ali requiring him to swear the oath of allegiance to him, but he refused and also request, refused with him a number of others. Fatima alayhi salam met Amr at the door and said to him, O oh, son of Al-Khattab, are you really going to burn my house down, my house door rather? He said yes, and this is stronger than what your father had brought. 
Ali went and swore it. The same incident is narrated by Shias from many avenues. It is interesting, but it is also narrated by the mentor of Sunni narrators of Hadith. I'm quoting the words of Sheikh Tumsi. But they used to narrate what would safeguard them. They may be alert to some of what they narrate, so they stop their narration there off. Yet what choice can one really have when he sees his house door set to fire so that he would be forced to swear fealty? This is found in Talqis al-Shafi, volume 3, page 76. Sharif al-Murtala. Sharif al-Murtala. The brother of Sharif al-Ravi, the compiler of Nashr Badagha, and Sharif al-Murtala is the compiler of Ash-Shafi fil Imama, in addition to numerous other rasail pertaining to hadith and the Arabic language and what have you. Sharif al-Murtala states, We have made it quite clear that the narrative regarding such burning has been narrated by non-Shias who cannot be charged. The excuse which he used regarding this burning, if true, is quite interesting. How can anyone seek an excuse for someone who wanted to burn the house of a commander of the faithful and of Fatima? Now, I want to make quite clear here that I'm not in a position today where I am justifying the argumentation utilized by Sheikh Atusi or Sharif al murtala in fact, their argumentation is of very little use for tonight's show. I've quoted it in order to give a full context. Tonight's show is about one thing and one thing alone. Whether or not this opinion is a shah's isolated opinion amongst the autad, the pillars of the imamiyya. Interestingly enough, we also have Sharif al-Murtada statements in refutation of Abdul Jabbar, Abdul Jabbar al-Mu'tazali. For those of you who are curious to know more about this particular event, I urge you, I urge you all to refer back to the Rasail of al-Jahiz, the famous Mu'tazali someone who's known to be an expert in Arabic grammar, the famous author of Kitab al-Haywan, al-Jahf. Jahf, in his defense of the attack of the door, which of course has been quoted by secondary sources as his original work no longer survives, but secondary sources which do not always suffer from a Shi'i imami taint in theology, and therefore we have no reason to believe they are lying presents several defenses for why he thinks the attack on the door was justified. This is interesting because it provides an account of those who believe in this and yet are of the proponents of the camp which attacked the house of Fatima. So we see that historically there is much evidence pertaining to this. But let me go quickly to one more scholar who I believe is considered to be someone of the utmost importance when looking at this particular event because he belongs to a camp which is normally affiliated with a slightly watered down, slightly more sunified version of Shiism from the classical scholars. His name is Abdul Jalal al qazwini And for anyone that's famous with his work, I myself have not read it because I do not know the Farsi language. They would find that this work, one of the earliest works we have written in the Farsi language from the Shia scholars, and this is from the year 560 after Hijri, a book entitled Naqt. A Naqt is written in response to another book called Some Rafadi Scandals. Abdul Jalal al Qazwini has said the following They claim that Amr hit Fatima in the stomach killing a fetus in her womb, whom the messenger of Allah had called al Hassan. The answer to this is, this is true. Shias and Sunnis have recorded it in their respective books, but it has been narrated about the chosen one, alayhi salam, namely Al-Mustafa, that he had said actions are judged according to intentions. 
If Omar's purpose was to secure the oath of allegiance from Ali, and he did not intend to cause any miscarriage, and perhaps Omar did not know that Fatima was behind the door, his killing of her fetus will be by mistake, unintentionally. Even if he had killed him deliberately, he was not an infallible man. Allah is the one who will judge him, not we, and nothing more can be said. Allah knows best about his servants' actions, inward thoughts, and what they hide. And they say that Amr and Uthman prohibited Fatima from weeping upon her father, etc., etc. These passages from a naqt of Abdul Jalal al Qazwini show a man eager to exonerate and free from the accusation some of the actions reported about Amr al Khattab. Again, tonight I'm not in the maqam of discussing these accusations, whether or not they're found in reliable reports or not. I'm quoting only what Shia scholars have had to say. And we find that they seem to be unanimous upon the general event of an attack on the door. Likewise, we find Abu Salah al-Halabi, the leader of the Halab Hawza and the writer of the famous work, Al-Kafi fil-Fiqh. The great faqih and gifted orator, Abu Salah al-Halabi, May Allah has mer have mercy on him, has said the following. They harmed Ali alayhi salam because he did not go along with what they wanted him to do. And they were rough when they spoke to him and exaggerated in their threats to him. They brought firewood to burn his house and assault it with men without per his permission. They brought him tied up, thus forcing his wife, daughters, women and kinsfolk from Bani Hashim and others to go out of their homes. They surrounded him with her unsheathed swords and promised to kill him if he refused to swear fealty to them. This is found in the book Taqrib al-Ma'arif. Now, of course, this is not merely a report. This is a commentary from Abu Salah al-Halabi, showing that he believes in the event. All these quotes that I've quoted tonight have been for one and one reason alone, to demonstrate that the belief in the attack upon the house of Fatima is not a shav position amongst the ulama. Thank you, dear viewers, and please join me again for more episodes in this series. I believe there is one more. Wassalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.